we're recording this meeting right now and uh, getting. So there's going to be our agenda tonight, uh, LPNA business, a district two update by Vanessa. Uh, Ashley Katz will uh, show us how to live green. Uh, environmental services, Linda will uh, tell us a little bit about recycling. And we'll give an update from Andrea Erton on the bridge housing communities or the uh, emergency housing over there at Bernal and Rue Ferrari. Should we start with Barbara? Before that, I'd like to take a moment of silence, all of us, for the many families and their friends who have suffered loss during this horrible pandemic. And we wish them well going forward as they travel outside into a more normal world. So, Getting on with our meeting now, Barbara. Barbara, are you muted? Unmuting myself. There you go. Can, can you go to that slide? Which slide? My, the slide with the two projects. I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that we're um, that uh, LPNA is working on that are going to uh, um, we're, that we're looking for volunteers on. Uh, if you can't get it, I'll just talk to it. I, it's up there, Barbara. I have uh, the LPNA. not being shared. It's not being shared. It's not. No. Nope. No, the agenda is up. Oh my goodness. Hold on a second, folks. we go. So we have two projects currently where we're actively looking for volunteers. The first is a partnership with, between LPNA and the San Jose CERT program, which uh, CERT stands for Community Emergency Response Team. To working on radio communication for Los Paseos, we'll be using handheld radios that don't require a license, so no testing involved. Uh, and this is to coordinate community response in the event of an earthquake, flood, wildfire, or other unforeseen emergency. Um, if you are interested in disaster response and or CERT, uh, and CERT program offers, uh, San Jose offers CERT training in emergency response, uh, contact our LPNA board member and CERT member, Herb Bowen, and that's at KD6IRG, that's an I, not a one, at yahoo.com. The second project is a native plant garden for Los Paseos Park. It was delayed somewhat by the pandemic, but we're going to be planting some test plants very shortly in the next few days. Uh, the full planting is expected to happen in the fall. Fall is the best time uh, to, to do the planting, let the plants uh, get strength over the rainy season. Uh, we'll need volunteers to help plan, to help plant, and to uh, on, ongoing maintenance of the garden. We've had a couple of people step forward recently, and so we, we have a few volunteers already. Thanks very much for those who've stepped forward. And uh, anyone who's interested in working on the Native Plant Project, contact me, Barbara Canup, at treasurer at lospaseosneighbors.com. Where's the garden? Uh, it's... <laughs> It's, it's 
um, between the picnic area, the main picnic area and the tennis courts closer to the tennis courts in an area of land that is where there's nothing currently. Uh, the main advantage of it is it's near the irrigation. So uh, we'll be able to get put in a, um, a, a drip line irrigation for the native plants, which is the best option for them. Uh, it has an issue with shade, so we'll be a little bit limited there in which plants we can plant. But um, it's, um, it, is, it is moving forward. I, within the next few days, I'm going to be starting to plant the test plants. Thank you, Barbara. And that's all I had. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and share. Uh, Karen, are you ready? Karen? I am ready with uh, Ashley and Alex's presentation, yes. Okay, so, I'll uh, stop sharing now. Alex is actually going to start and she doesn't, yeah. she's not going to use screen sharing. She's okay. just going to talk. So I just wanted to introduce um, Ashley Katz, who is one of our Las Paseos neighbor, Las Paseos neighbors, and her sister-in-law, Alex, um, is it Gamboa? Alex Gamboa Grand. Yeah, Grand. Um, Alex actually lives in the Portland area, but um, the Katz family in general are very into the going green efforts and um, trying to eliminate waste. And so we thought they'd be a great source uh, of, of encouragement for us um, to you know, get a handle on some things that we can do in our lives to uh, you know, have, have less waste and stuff. So you guys take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start out. So um, my name is Alex Grand. Um, like Karen mentioned, I am Ashley's um, sister-in-law and I'm also one of the co-founders of Good Intent, which is a um, low-waste shop that offers resources and supplies to support a sustainable living. So I have been really inspired in recent years. Like many of us, I've cared about the environment for a long time, but you know, felt like there was pretty little that I could do on an individual basis to actually make a difference when it comes to the climate crisis. Aside from recycling, which is something that I think, you know, a lot of us have focused our efforts on. And I know there's someone that's going to be talking more about recycling later, but, um, you know, it wasn't actually until I met Ashley's brother, coincidentally, that I started realizing more ways that we can be intentional about our other daily actions that, that can make a huge impact. You know, he had habits that, you know, I never had really thought about considering, like, he never used paper towels, like when he was going to a public restroom or at home, he just avoided paper towels altogether. He also tried to avoid using multiple dishes per day. Um, you know, he tried to use like one pot when he was cooking or one dish when he was eating, you know, his, his entire meal. There lots of little things like that. And also considering packaging and other things that I'd never really thought about. Um, and then I also, I, um, re I got my MBA and I studied social innovation and entrepreneurship. And I started realizing the power that we have as individual consumers to really shift, you know, all the waste that the a lot of companies are producing by basically voting with their dollars and um and and telling these companies what we care about and what we value so i want to talk a little bit i know someone's going to be talking about recycling more later but i want to talk a little bit about recycling is not this end-all be-all solution so you know for one thing what is recycling it's you know hoping that the material is we use when we put them in the recycling bin are going to be processed and be able to be um, turned into a new product. But actually in the reality, only 9%, let's talk about plastic, for example, only 9% of plastic that's ever been produced has actually been recycled. A lot of us are doing what's called wish cycling, which ends up kind of contaminating the recycling. Um, and a lot of us are, you know, don't even have access to recycling and a lot of it is going straight to landfill or it's ending up in our environment. But recycling is also only dealing with one stage of a, a material's life cycle. And so it's important to think about the entire life cycle from beginning to end. So plastic, for example, is in my mind, it's enemy number one um, for a couple, for several reasons along the entire life cycle. One of which is the beginning of its life. It's extracted, it's, it's made from fossil fuels. In the extraction of fossil fuels, basically what you know, petroleum is, it's carbon that's been stored under the, under the Earth's surface for 
thousands and thousands, millions of years. And um, once um, the fossil fuels are extracted from the earth, not only does it disrupt that ecosystem, it also releases that carbon into the, ecos into the environment, which is a greenhouse gas that's causing global warming. The production process, you know, in the next stage of its life cycle, also releases a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. And that, that pollution, while it's out of sight, out of mind for a lot of us, it most often affects communities of color and has poor and um, leads to poor health outcomes as well in those communities. So that's its second stage of its life cycle, and it's still having all these harmful impacts. And then we're using it, and many of you may know that there are chemicals in plastic that are also having harmful impacts on our bodies as we're using it. We actually consume about a credit card's amount of plastic every week, the average American, because so much of what we're interacting with, we, a lot of us use plastic basically every day in some way or form, whether it's plastic packaging for food we use, whether it's um, the personal care product packaging that we're using, whether it's the actual drink cups or something that we're using, we're consuming a lot of that. And, um, and there, there are some negative health outcomes that come from that. And then what happens when we dispose of it at the next stage? Ideally it gets recycled. Um, but plastic actually is one material that can only, that has limited ability to be recycled. Could it only be recycled a couple of times before it's too degraded? Other materials like um, metals and glass and paper can re be recycled more and more, some of them infinitely. But you know, ultimately if plastic ends up in a landfill, it also leaches harmful chemicals into the environment or you know, if it ends up in the oceans, like we know happens so often, it ends up having poor outcomes for wildlife and so on and so forth, right? Like that's the entire life cycle. So recycling is only addresses one stage of that. So what can we do? I mean, that's, there's good news and bad news there, right? On the bad news side is that recycling is not a full solution to this problem. But on the good news is that there's actually a lot more we can do with our daily actions. And the low waste lifestyle is all about minimizing waste altogether. It means cutting waste out from the waste from the source. It means minimizing our overall consumption. And there are a variety of ways that you can do that. One of which is by thinking about um, replacing um, disposable options with return um, reusable alternatives. One of the ways we can do that is thinking about the packaging we're using trying to minimize the packaging with the products that we're using or trying to opt for plastic free packaging as much as possible. And so Ashley has a variety, is gonna be sharing a variety of examples of this that she's applied in her life. But I think something that's really important to think about is that there are so many benefits of these actions as well. I think a lot of us have this kind of misconception that to live more sustainably, it's more expensive, it's inconvenient, it takes a lot of our time. And, you know, a lot of people realistically, you know, we have really busy schedules, you might have families, it might be hard to get a lot of people on board to these changes in habits. And also we just, it can be hard to change our own deeply ingrained habits, right? But I just want to reassure everyone that there's something everyone can do and it really doesn't have to be a huge burden. It really doesn't have to be super time consuming. There really is something everyone can do. And those little changes can make a huge difference. If you're swapping out one thing you use, let's say a plastic toothbrush, every plastic toothbrush you've ever used still exists on the earth. So if you swap just that one toothbrush for a, um, a compostable bamboo alternative, that's so many toothbrushes that you're not contributing to the environment. And imagine if you kind of pass that along to your whole family, that can have a huge impact and it adds up the more and more of us do that. It also sends messages to companies that we don't want to use plastic toothbrushes anymore. You know, that's just one example out of many, but there's so many things that we can do. And I think it's also really important to, um, to kind of grow this movement is to not feel bad about, you know, trying to be perfect. There, you know, there's a zero waste um, movement that I think probably makes a lot of people feel too intimidated to even try. And so something that Ashley and I talk about is how important it is to just start somewhere and help people feel like they can do something because it really does matter. All those things do add up. So I will let Ashley take it over and share some of the examples that she's already started implementing in her life. Thank you so much, Alex. Alex is such an inspiration to me because 
there's there's so much of that like put your money where your mouth is and she's really done that and I thank her so much and my brother has also been a huge inspiration to me because he was like one of those first people where I'm like um for me like how did this start like um so um I read this thing about this woman B Johnson I don't know if you guys have heard of her but it was like um she spent an entire year and she put all her garbage into one mason jar and I was like what how 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 I was like well she must be recycling everything no no she literally spent I mean she spent a very long time figuring out how to do this right but she put she didn't recycle anything she literally figured out how to not have any waste and the only way she had was in a mason jar. And I was like, that's crazy. How did she do that? And so I bought her book and I read it. And I mean, she's incredible and a huge inspiration, but also what got me was, okay, the fires in California. And I was like, okay, our world is going to hell. Like what is happening? And then I heard this thing about um, by 2050, there's gonna be more plastic in the ocean than fish. I don't know if you guys have heard this, but good God, that is frightening, right? And then I think you guys have probably heard as well that there's like this garbage heap the size of Texas in the ocean. And I was like, uh, this is a major problem. And then I watched a um, documentary that was talking about, we have 60 years of soil left, 60 years. And then we literally have no, no soil, no food. We're screwed. Right. And I was like, well, enough waiting around for somebody else to do something. I better get on it. Right. We better all get on it because if we don't change our ways like yesterday, we are shit out of luck. Right. We better all be B Johnson's. Right. So um, I was like, OK, what can I do and what can I do right this minute? Right. So I know I went all out extreme over the top and. Um, Alex definitely helped and Colby definitely helped. And I was just like, I need to do it and I need to do it now. Now, I also had some other things happen to me. I have epilepsy and I found, I went, started going to these doctors and I was like, okay, these seizures are destroying my life. What's going on? And they said, well, your microbiome is destroyed because of inflammation. And I said, what is causing this inflammation? And they said, well, basically our basically there's so many chemicals in the foods that we eat nowadays that um, it causes inflammation. So you need to figure out what's causing the inflammation for you. And it's, it's basically comes down to wheat isn't what it used to be. And there's so many chemicals in every pesticide and it causes inflammation in all of our bodies, but your body is um, manifesting it as seizures. Other people's man bodies are manifesting it as, you know, diabetes, cancer, whatever else, you name it. Um, plastics are causing us so many problems. Monsanto is putting so many chemicals in all of our foods and all of this stuff. Um, and I was just like, okay, first of all, I want to give my kids a future. I want to give myself a future. And I want to be able to live my daily life, right? And I don't want to live feeling diseased and sick and horrible. So I decided right then and there, I'm going to take control and I'm going to do everything I can for the planet, for myself and for my children. Okay. So I'm going to share with you the things that I've done over the past year. And yes, some of them are going to seem over the top and no, you're not going to be able to do them this moment. And my husband was like, holy crap, slow down woman. <laughs> right. Because some of them did cost a lot of money. Some of them didn't cost that much money. Um, some of them were easy. Some of them were harder than others, right? And I recommend to you that you do what seems reasonable to you. Take it one step at a time. Do one thing or two things. And then when you're like, you know what? This isn't so bad. Try one more thing, okay? And if some of them are, you're like, no, that's not gonna fit my lifestyle. Then don't do that one or do it later, right? So I bought these stasher bags. Here's a picture right here. These stasher bags um, are like Ziploc bags. Now I tried several different Ziploc replacement bags 
And I absolutely hated the first ones I bought. They were super stupid. <laughs> they had slides on them and the slides didn't work very well. So I wasted a bunch of money, but I put the good ones on here for you guys. Um, they are just like Ziplocs, only they are dishwasher safe and they're made of silicone and they work fantastically. There are lots of different sizes. Um, you can freeze them, you can boil them, you can put them in the dishwasher and they're safe and effective and they're amazing. And I never have to buy Ziploc bags ever again. And it's fantastic. Um, so those replace Ziploc bags and they work just as well, if not better. And I freeze all my stuff in them, all my fruit, stuff like that. Pyrex, right? Glass is the way to go. Get rid of plastic. You should never be microwaving plastic anyways. They do have, um, and, and replaces Rubbermaid. I use all glass dishes and metal dishes, obviously metal you can't microwave, but um, I don't put the lids in the dishwasher because plastic, they have plastic lids and that leaches into my food, um, which you should never do. Um, but, um, so it's not perfect, but it's much better. Um, but you can't go from hot to cold or cold to hot. So that's something to keep in mind. Ball jars for making things at home or replacing um, canned goods. Um, because as we know, BPA are in cans and BPA is not good for you, but it's good for freezing things and buying in bulk. I take my ball jars to Whole Foods and I ask them to put things directly into the ball jars, right? I can put um, peanut butter from the Whole Foods dispensers. You can put meat instead of getting it wrapped in paper at Whole Foods. You can say, hey, can you put the, I mean, I buy, I make like, um, I get like chicken feet or chicken thighs or whatever. And I ask them, can you just put the, the meat directly into this ball jar? And they will do the um, tear, like the weight directly on the ball jar and they'll put it directly into the ball jar and I'll take it home and put it directly into my freezer so I don't have to waste the paper. Um, metal containers with silicone lids, replace plastic lunch containers, single use, le use lunch containers. Um, I also take those metal containers back when we could go to restaurants and I know we're getting back to that again. Um, so I never have to get styrofoam containers because we all know styrofoam is horrible for the earth. And at first people looked at me funny, but usually the comments I got was, oh my gosh, that's genius. You brought your own containers for the leftovers. Good for you. I also um, uh, carry around silverware. I have bamboo, a bamboo set of silverware. And I know Alex carries that around with her as well. Um, or you could carry around metal, whatever, keep it in your purse. They have sets of it that have just like a top on it so that it doesn't get gross. Um, Metal straws, obviously. I know that people know about those already. Um, bamboo or metal silverware. Metal cups, right? I have those instead of plastic cups now. Um, silicone lids. Uh, those just go on top of my bowls. So I never have to use plastic wraps. Um, sill pads, if anybody's ever seen those. I know those used to be popular, I feel like, when I was a kid. Um, and instead of using parchment paper for the bottom of my cookie sheets, um, veggie huggers, that's a, these are veggie huggers right here. You put them on the edge of like, if you have like a half of an onion or a half of a cucumber and you notice they have different sizes of these. So you can put them on. Um, yeah, they also have um, bamboo or you can, um, not bamboo, sorry. They have um, the beeswax ones. You just can't get those hot or the beeswax melts. Um, or they have like the little, um, the ones that look like they go like shower cap ones, little different ones. I love these. These are avocado huggers. They're so cute. I love the avocado huggers. Those are my favorite, but all those different size ones. Um, um, I don't know if you can do the containers with the pandemic. You might have to wait until the pandemic is done. Um, uh, what was your comment, Alex? Use the reusable cloth bags instead of jars at the grocery store for food in the bulk section. Yes, absolutely. So 
yeah, I, and I put the reusable grocery bags for transporting groceries. Um, most people are doing that, although I have seen most people are not doing that during the pandemic, but we still are. So I know that you can do that. Um, we just wash them um, every time now that we use them. And then the mesh bags for veggies and fruit. Um, a lot of people have not done this, and I really don't know why. Um, you really, you can get these mesh bags for veggies and fruit. Okay, they look like this, or they can look slightly differently. We have some that look a little bit different than this too. Um, and we also, uh, if, if they don't let us take these in, we just leave ours out. Just, we just put like apples in our cart and then we bring them home, put them into our bags. And then when we get home, we just put them into our bags. And it works just as well, because really, do you need that plastic? I mean, I don't, I don't know what, what it's good for, to be honest with you. But that's up to you, obviously. But as soon as the pandemic is over, there's really no reason for it, right? If you use these mesh bags, it's the, really the way to go. Um, buy in bulk, take um, whenever you can. We try to not buy the stuff as much at Trader Joe's because we're trying to tell Trader Joe's, stop with the plastic, people. They are so, they use so much plastic at Trader Joe's. I love Trader Joe's. Don't get me wrong. It's one of my favorite places, but they use so much plastic. Um, anytime we can buy like carrots, not in plastic versus in plastic, we buy the carrots outside the plastic because we vote with our dollars. We really do. And we're telling the stores we want the stuff out of the plastic. And I know it's more expensive to buy organic, but honestly, I've gone to functional medicine doctors and they've told me a hundred times, whatever you do, anytime you can buy organic. If you look at the EWG website, clean 15, dirty dozen buy the clean 15. If you, if you're choosing between organic and non-organic, you're putting so many chemicals in your body. If you're buying the, um, the stuff on the dirty dozen list, um, if you have the choice, if you have the option, if you can afford to buy organic, do it for your body, do it for yourself. Cause, um, what they always tell me is you're paying now or you're paying later. So it's up to you. Um, you know, um, look for glass jars of plastic and reuse the glass jars. So for example, when I buy my peanut butter, I always opt for the glass jar for the peanut butter. And then I just reuse them instead of buying more ball jars. I have so many glass peanut butter jars and I just keep using those glass peanut butter jars. And now I use my, when I make chicken stock, I put my chicken stock in my glass peanut butter jars. So this is like a good starter kit kind of thing is what that might look like. Um, kitchen replacements. So I went and had a Norwex party and I got rid of all my paper towels and I haven't used paper towels in a year. I use microfiber towels to wipe down my countertops. Um, microfiber is absolutely amazing. Um, the one caveat to that is microfiber can go into the ocean. So I bought a guppy bag um, and you just put the microfiber towels into a guppy bag. And then you, when you wash those in the, in the washing machine, um, you put them into the guppy bag. And then if there's any microfiber, you throw that into the garbage so it doesn't go into the ocean. Um, but it replaces paper towels and rags to wipe down counters. I still have towels, like old towels that I use in case there's like grease or anything like that. Cause I don't want to ruin my Norwex towels. Um, uh, let's see, when do you say I start putting them through the dishwasher to reuse? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. Glass jars really come in handy. It's amazing. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic. I bought a, um, a dish soap block and it lasts about four months is what I found. How, how long does yours last, Alex? I know you use a dish soap block as well. Ours probably yeah. lasts about six months, but yeah, that's just for two of us. Yeah. yeah. It's also, it also works really well as like a stain remover. It's kind of a great all purpose. So I even use it to like mop with and stuff. So it's kind nice. of all purpose. Nice. I also bought a Norwex mop. Um, that's a sweeper and a mopper and all you use is water, which is fantastic. Um, Norwex has been amazing. It's a fantastic company and it's all, they only use water. And that's kind of the whole thing is no more chemicals. Don't put chemicals on your, in your house or on your body. Don't put it in your nose. Don't put it in your, you know, your, your eyes, nose, mouth, that kind of stuff. Um, get it out of your life. Right. Um, 
So, and I do have some um, dish soap under the sink just in case I have like some really greasy something if I need it, but I hardly ever use it. That dish soap that I've had under my sink is still like three quarters full and I've had it for a year as like my backup underneath the sink. But this also comes with no packaging, which I absolutely love. Um, it's fantastic. I would, I would never go back. Um, so I'm eliminating that plastic from the dispenser I'm from the packaging and the limiting I'm not going through all that that liquid soap um, and we just rub the you know the that thing on there or you can use a um, a cloth and you just rub it and then rub it into your dishes it's great um, and we have a glass soap dispenser for our hands with Castile soap which is very safe and very concentrated it's you know you have like the giant bottle of Castile soap and I think I use um, an eighth of a cup to make a giant bottle of hand soap. That's, you know, the foaming hand soap. Um, cloth napkin, I mean, you could use bar soap, but my kids just make a mess of bar soap. So we use it as foaming hand soap, um, which apparently you can also use as shampoo, which I don't know, I haven't tried that yet, but I was just reading about it on the Castile soap. You can use that for anything. Um, Cash. Oh, okay. So your question is shampoo and conditioner in bulk. Um, I, uh, I'm actually been, my, my kids have been using the, um, I'll get to this, but my kids have been using, um, uh, shampoo bars, um, and it works great for them and they just use a bar of shampoo. Um, I haven't been using that because um, I have dandruff, so I have to use. I haven't. I haven't tried it on my own self, and I also have um, an epilepsy medication that's making me lose my hair, which has been a nightmare. So I haven't tried that, but I'm a work in progress. But for normal hair, I would say um, the bars. The and you use the shampoo bar too, right, Alex? I do. Yeah, I'm trying not to talk about <laughs> restore too much, but we do have a lot of. Shampoo bars can be really great. I think um, there's a lot of bad ones out there, but there are a lot that work really well. It, it depends on if you have hard or soft water, but there are some shampoo bars that are actual shampoo and some that are actually hair soap. So if you have um, hard water, which I believe you guys do. Um, then we you do have it. very hard water. And like we, we, you, we carry a high bar brand that is actual shampoo bars. And we actually just have a new, there's a new variety that's specifically for itchy and dry scalp and dandruff. But a lot of bulk, a lot of stores like co-ops and stuff will carry a liquid shampoo and conditioner in bulk. And so you, if you, if there's a store like that in your area, and I think actually in the Bay area, there's a pretty, there's like the rainbow something, I believe there are some like bulk stores um, in the Bay area. I know that that would carry um, bulk shampoo and you can bring your own containers to refill that. Ooh, you know about deodorant? I actually bought a deodorant at Norwex that I swear it like never goes away. It's like magic. I don't know. Um, you like wet it and you use it and. Oh, it's, is it like a, um, the mineral? It's like a salt. What is it called? There's like a kind that's basically like a, a block of salt. They use. Yeah. It's know. amazing. I've had the same deodorant for like a year and a half. And I swear it's like this much smaller than it was when I bought it. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. Look into it. It's a, it's a Norwex thing and it's a natural deodorant. It's amazing. There are actually a lot of different deodorant options that are like zero waste. I think there are some that are like that, actually, that I highly recommend too. And there are others, you, there basically are a lot of options now. There are others that come in like a paper tube. There are others that come in glass jars. And it's just a little bit of trial and error. And what I would say also about deodorants, especially if you're trying a natural deodorant, is give yourself a couple weeks for your body to adjust because you, especially if you're using a, a deodorant with aluminum, you do have to kind of like your body has to detox basically and it, it'll you'll like smell bad for a couple of weeks but luckily we're in pandemic so you have a little <laughs> bit of time, no, the time. <laughs> but then after that your body will adjust and, and natural deodorants will work well but a lot of people don't get through the the stinky phase so i just wanted to put that out there yeah, Ashley so, yeah and alex this is greg um we're running a little late on time okay to let you know all right Thank you. Um, That's good, good info. Thank you, though. All right. Well, do you want me to just share the rest of my document? People can read it on their own and they can oh, go, go ahead. Give a couple more minutes. 
Okay. All right. I'll just go quick and I won't, I won't read the questions right now and people can email me if they have any. Um, yeah. So bamboo toilet paper feels like regular toilet paper, highly recommended. Bamboo grows much faster. Um, so it's great for the earth. Um, same with the facial tissue. Like I mentioned, the shampoo bars, they have microfiber towels that you, you don't have to use shampoo at, or, or soap even at all. Um, the laundry powder, which is totally natural, dryer balls instead of dryer sheets. Dryer sheets are extremely toxic. I highly recommend people stop using those at all. Those are like one of the most toxic things we have in our households. Um, reusable pads, panty liners. There's just no reason to use the throwaway ones if you can if you can stomach the idea of using, using reusable ones because those are so bad in our landfills. Um, menstrual cups replacing tampons. Those are, I highly recommend if, you know, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but those also, again, are huge landfills taking, taking up. Do you want to go to the next slide? Um, holiday gifts and ideas. One of the best things that I've come across is giving the gift of experiences my kids think it's the best thing I've ever done where I'll say, okay, the whole day is yours. You get to plan it and we'll do whatever you want for the whole day. And they will tell me, this is the best thing you've ever done is the best day of my life. And we'll just like watch a movie and go on a hike and eat a meal of their choice and a dessert of their choice. And they're like, they think it's better than any gift they've ever gotten. Um, and then these are just some other ideas by second hand. Um, uh, capsule wardrobe. So buying things that you just love. Obviously these are solar panels, double pane windows, spray foam insulation. We just got that and it's fantastic, more expensive, but you know, um, shop B corporations when you have an option, if you see something that says B corporation, um, they're, they're doing what they should for the earth and for their employees. So by all means, if you see that, um, Here's some good um, uh, resources. The Zero Waste Home by B. Johnson has fantastic ideas. I highly recommend it. Food Fix by Mark Hyman is basically like how we can solve all of our, our problems based on food. The Need to Grow documentary. Um, this is Alex's um, email. Um, and then I will share my um, document with you guys in the chat in just a second. So you can check it out for yourself and feel free to save it. And I'll put my email on there as well. And I'll put Alex's on there. So that way, if you have any more questions, you can feel free to email either one of us. I have done a year's worth of research. So feel free to give either one of us. Um, Alex is really more of an expert than me. I've just done my own personal stuff, but um, feel free. And, and Alex has a ton of um, blogs, um, because that's what she does. So, um, if you want information, like a lot of you guys are asking really good questions. Um, she has, she's answered a lot of stuff on her blog. So, um, feel free to use either one of us as a resource. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ashley. There's uh, one real quick question, uh, then we can get on and I'm going to share, if you don't mind sharing your, um, slide deck, uh, to everybody who is here tonight, plus all the other LPNA members. Yeah. Okay, that'd be good. And uh, Michael Van Dam asked, uh, he's been using bulk washcloths for every kitchen need for years, is wondering whether the washing them versus the cost of using paper towels with all the energy costs, what's your opinion on washable mm. bags versus? Well, I would say as far as the cost goes, I think, I have found for me using the, I've been using the Norwex for a year. And I think that, um, that that's much better. Um, as far as energy cost goes, because I throw my, um, reusable stuff in, um, one load a week, but I, I mean, I guess it depends on, on, on how much you're washing and how often, but I have found, I also have a brand new washing machine. And so my, my, my washer is very low um, low cost as far as that goes. Thank you. I'll just say that I don't do any additional laundry or anything with using reusable cloths. I think you also find that you don't need to use them quite as much as you think you had to before. So 
I'll just throw that out there. That it doesn't really need to be much additional work or waste or anything. Hello, this is Terry from Carrier to Creek. I have a question for Ashley. Um, when it comes to the recycled bin, um, is it that a lot of plastics in the recycled bin still end up in the um, the, the 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 landfill, meaning garbage over? Excuse me, Terry. Um, uh, Lyndon will probably talk about that when she gives her presentation. Okay, sure. Thank you. We need to move on. And um, thank you, Dr. Um, I will share the, the, the uh, chat with everybody also. There's a lot of good information in the chat I saw. And thank you very much for that presentation. It was very informative and uh, I will definitely be getting in contact with you. Thank you for your email address. Thank you, Ashley and Alex. It's a pleasure, thank you. Welcome. All right. So, so Greg, are, is Vanessa back on? Vanessa should be here. Okay, great. Vanessa? Yes, I'm here. That was a great presentation. Thank you for all of that wonderful information. Um, so I have a quick update. I know you all are waiting to hear about the bridge housing sites from um, Andrea, so I'll, I can go really quickly. So I'm sure everyone has heard on the news, we are now in the orange tier. Uh, what does that mean? That means that there are some additional businesses that are going to be reopened with restrictions and limitations. You can visit the state website, the blueprint for a safer um, economy on the state's website and you can see what is allowed and what is not. Uh, we are glad to say that vaccinations are increasing countywide. However, there is still a shortage. Not everyone is eligible yet. We just heard from the governor that as of April 1st, folks over the age of uh, 50 and over will be eligible. And then as of um, April 15th, hopefully it'll open up to everyone. We'll see if the supply actually meets that uh, high demand for vaccinations in the County of Santa Clara. Um, I recommend that everyone visit the county website to see when it is your turn and to get vaccinated when it is your turn. Um, in terms of COVID-19 and homelessness, we had this week at City Council an update on uh, homelessness and COVID-19 and how the city is helping support our homeless population. Just so that you know, in District 2, we're doing our part. We have our Southside Safe Parking uh, Program, which currently houses 18 households. They are allowed to park safely at the Southside Safe Park uh, safe parking site, which is sort of the back parking lot near the, um, the fire station. For those of you that know the community center, uh, there are 18 households currently there. They have some space. They can take an additional two to four uh, more cars, and they have a couple RVs already there, but unfortunately don't have any additional support uh, for or spaces for RVs. This is a really great program. Um, Greg and Herb were at the community meeting on that around that site today um, and got some updates. Um, just in the last quarter, four of the participants were housed, we're, we're able to find permanent housing. So it's a program that will be with us in South San Jose, um, at least through the end of this year, when there will be a new request for a proposal out. Um, and hopefully that will result in the extension of the program and maybe even the expansion of the program uh, to more um, to more folks who are who are in need of a safe place to park. Um, our bridge housing communities are also going are also all up and running. I believe they're at full capacity. I won't talk too much about those because Andrea will provide those updates. Um, and then additionally, in the mayor's March budget message, um, it was approved that we are going to expand our SOAR sites. SOAR stands for Support, Outreach, Assistance, and Resource Sites. And basically, what this is is providing sanitation um, and additional services to some of our large larger encampments throughout the city. So as many of you know, as a result of COVID-19, the city has been very limited in its abatements. Uh, we're trying not to disperse and displace um, homeless folks from the locations in which they're camping to try and reduce the spread of COVID. Uh, after last week's, uh, this week, sorry, uh, council meeting it was decided that abatements will begin again. I don't believe they're gonna increase immediately uh, to the level that we saw before COVID, but there will be some abatements of sites, especially sites around sensitive areas in particular around schools um, since schools are going to be reopening in the near future. So we will be seeing some abatements, which of course will cause some displacements of homeless folks, but we are keeping open our homeless shelters at um, the South Hall, as well as additional resources such as motel vouchers. 
Um, one of the great projects that we're working on, it's a long-term project and we're really in the infant stages of it is um, the revisioning of Monterey Road. So council member Jimenez has um, made this a priority for his second and last term on council. We really want to to create Monterey Road, or not to create, but to, but to make Monterey Road the gateway that it should be into our community. And I know Los Paseos is, is you know, right there next to Monterey Road. Right now, Monterey Road is overtaken by blight, illegal dumping, litter. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to reimagine it. We're trying to bring resources um, in terms of support to the small businesses that are along the, the gateway. We also want to bring additional support in terms of blight, litter pickup, and, and uh, deterrence to illegal dumping. And this will include things like setting up cameras, creating no dumping zones, increasing fines for dumping in certain areas. Uh, we also want to increase public safety. So working with our law enforcement partners to make sure that it's a safe road for everyone in terms of traffic safety as well as crime. And then also trying to figure out how we can use our limited resources to bring things like public art and really try to revitalize the area. So this is something that we're working on. It's, it's a long-term goal for our, for our uh, second term. And what we will be doing in the near future is we're going to be um, uh, talking to neighborhood associations and to all of our residents to see what is it that you would like to see Monterey Road on Monterey Road in terms of traffic safety and all of the items that I've mentioned so that we can really start looking at ways to invest into this gateway um, so that it, it gets cleaned up and it's a it's a place that we can all be proud of in the district. And then just some quick updates on things that are specific to the Los Paseos Neighborhood Association. So I don't have an update, unfortunately, on the house on the hill. So this is the project of a, a very large home that was submitted to the planning department to be built up on Tulare Hill. So as of right now, the homeowner or the property owner has not updated the uh, planning. Uh, so planning, they submitted a, a plan to planning and planning came back to them with some questions and some requests for some updates. They have not provided that to planning and there hasn't been any um, any movement or any updates on that uh, pending um, planning department permit in about a year. So we don't really know what's going on with that. Um, you, it is the ball is currently in the property owner's um, court to submit updated plans to the planning department, which would be reviewed for approval. Um, and then I also, Greg, unfortunately, don't have an update for you on the uh, sound wall on Bernal Road. So as many of you know, Greg has been advocating for that sound wall to be enhanced, to be extended so that it's taller to avoid some of the um, jumping over the wall that we've seen in the past and also just to get some more attention to that area because of graffiti and blight. Um, I don't have an update for you from the Department of Transportation, but we have reached out. And from the last time that we spoke, there is a um, Department of Transportation estimate on how much it would cost. Now it is our job to figure out where we find those funds. And then lastly, participatory budgeting. It seems so long ago, but as of March 5th, PB is completely done. So as of March 5th, the contract with Safer San Jose was completed. Um, so that means that the all of the funds have been dispersed to Safer San Jose for the camera project. The cameras have been installed and the signs have been installed. So um, PB is now a thing of the past. That million dollars that your neighborhood got from um, the Calpine Energy has been expended and all of the projects have been implemented. So it was a long time coming. We appreciate your patience on that, um, but thankfully it's, it's, it's done. <laughs> so I'm available for any questions if anybody has any questions. Do you have any update on um, what's going on at the Santa Teresa Shopping Center as far as new businesses, um, what's being built up out front there, um, that kind of thing? Um, the Santa Teresa Shopping Center on, the, with the grocery outlet and the. Yes. Yes, so no, I do not. So just so you know, it is private property. So we don't get any information about what's going on there unless they submit um, a request for some kind of permitting, which um, to my knowledge, we haven't received any. Um, I know that Greg has been in touch with ROIC in the past. Um, they would be the best person to ask about, um, you know, if there's any new leases coming in for any of the vacant spaces. Um, I'm happy to reach out to um, 
to them as well. Um, but just so you know, they are a resource that they've been very, very willing and open to talking to the Neighborhood Association and providing updates on some of those spaces. So I know that, uh, for example, there was a gym that was going to go in there. Um, and that unfortunately, financially did not pan out for the for the person who was going to rent the space. Um, so that that didn't come to fruition. Um, and I'm not really sure what the status is of the current vacancies. Yeah, uh, and I can look into let it. Let me answer. Uh, Jeff, um, I'll get you some information. I'm not sure what your last name is totally, uh, W. Wagner. Uh, I heard from uh, RYC that it was going to be a, a small medical center for children, uh, doctor's offices of that nature. So um, let me try to find out. And if you want to, you can contact me. Um, you know how to contact me? Yeah, I think I have your number. Okay, yeah. Jeff, I, I just I added my last name. Yeah, okay, there you go, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll get in contact with you. I'll get you up to date on that. I, I only ask because there's a you're, you're always seeing different things floating around next door. So I, was, I there, thought it there was uh, this is Barbara. There was a there's a link in a thread on next door where somebody has posted a plan that was given to them by um, the I don't know if it's still ROIC. Um, with exactly what is going where and a diagram of, of what, what's going to be in the new building, which I believe is, is going to be medical and dental offices. Um, okay, I'll check. A lot, of, a lot of some of the shops are moving and diff it, there's, a, there's a shuffle going on. And there is a, there is a plan and it's been posted in Nextdoor. There's a link to it in Nextdoor. Okay, I'll look, I'll look for it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I think uh, Mike Van Dam had a question in the chat that says, um, uh, has COVID been a real problem with the homeless? He's thinking that m most of them are young, but compromised by the environment. Have you heard anything about that, Vanessa? Um, I don't know if the county, I think the county does track the number of cases that have been identified um, among our homeless population. Um, it was definitely the beginning um, of a very big concern in terms of a safe place for homeless individuals to be able to shelter in place. And so that is why the most of the encampments have stayed where they are. That is why the Molotov voucher program was open. And that is why we very quickly built the bridge housing communities on Monterey Road and Rue Ferrari. Um, a lot of our homeless population are folks over 65 and they are a lot of folks with compromised immune systems uh, because of either chronic conditions or um, addiction and the, you know, the, the basically the wear and tear on your body of being, of being unsheltered. Um, so it definitely, it has been a huge concern. I think that the safety measures that were put in in place at the beginning of the pandemic to get people housed and to get people tested regularly has definitely helped. Um, and so we have definitely, we haven't had any, um, what I would call is like massive, um, you know, contagion within our, within our homeless population because of the safety protocols that were put in place very early on in the pandemic. Thank you. Um, Teresa Petrak asks about any updates on the San Ignacio San Ignacio development, uh, the one by Santa Teresa, Great Oaks, and San Ignacio, what is being built there? Um, if you can give me the address, I could take a look exactly at which, uh, and take a look and see what the planning department has for us. I would just need the 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 exact address of, there's a, there's a few different developments happening in the Edenville Technology Park area, so um, I know, I think you might be talking about the one there's like a major construction and it's an expansion of a current um, of a current uh, business that was there, but I can double check that if you give me the exact address. Okay, we'll get, uh, Teresa, we'll get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. We appreciate the updates. Who's next, Greg? We have Lyndon. Okay, can, can I share my screen? I think you need to let me share my screen. I'll be darned. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna let you share your screen right now. Most kind of you. <laughs> well, it's kind of you to be here, so thanks a lot. Sure. All right, let's see if I can get this into the slideshow. Okay, so can you all see that? Yes. 
Okay, great. This is my first time doing this, so <laughs> we'll see how this goes. So I'm Lyndon Shea and I'm with the City of San Jose's Environmental Services Department. And maybe uh, some of you were here when I came to an in-person meeting, if any of us can remember when we used to do that back before the pandemic. Um, Greg invited me to a meeting, what, maybe like a year and a half ago or so. And so I'm uh, in the communications division and I work on uh, helping people find out how to recycle, right? And I really enjoyed, um, uh, Ashley, your presentation. And I'm sorry, now I'm blanking on Miss Gamboa Grand's first name. <laughs> but uh, you all made a lot of really great points and it's always inspiring to see uh, young people who are passionate about this and uh, passing on all the great information that they've gotten. So anyway, the, I'm here to help you guys learn how to recycle right, which is what we talked about last time I was here. And this is an ongoing thing for the city. And um, one, one thing that's really important is for people to learn how to recycle clean so that the stuff that they put in their recycle bin actually can be used. And so we're gonna talk about that and talk about some of the other um, waste management services that the city has and uh, answer whatever questions you have and then also touch a little bit on uh, the stuff that was already talked about in terms of uh, reduce and reuse. So anyway, let's see if I can. Oh, good, this works. Um, so you're, you're probably already aware of a lot of this, but why is it important to recycle? And there's a lot of reasons. Um, the first and foremost probably is to save resources. Um, one resource that we save by um, recycling is landfill space and we don't wanna have to be siting more landfills for people to put uh, garbage in. And um, when we recycle, we generate less pollution, we use less energy and we emit fewer greenhouse gases as was already mentioned. Um, in recognition of this, the state has enacted a lot of different laws around this, the main one being um, AB 939, which was back in the late 80s, which was the one that mandated certain percentages of materials to be diverted from the landfill into people into recycling. So that's sort of what got all these things going. And um, this is in part why the city established a zero waste goal uh, and the goal being to divert 90% of our waste from landfill by 2022. And um, so we, we established that quite a while ago. And I, I've spent the last year in the Emergency Operations Center for the city uh, addressing the pandemic. So I'm not exactly sure where we're at in terms of achieving that goal right now. But our strategies for doing that are reduce, reuse, and then also to recycle right. And in part, we need to really be mindful that we're recycling right, because as you probably heard quite a, several years ago now, what was it, maybe three or four years ago now, China, who uh, was taking most of our diverted materials, said that they no longer wanted them because they found that we were just sending them way too much garbage and uh, materials that were not clean and materials that they could not use easily. And so they increased, uh, their standards. And um, so now it's even more important for us to be mindful of what we recycle and how we do that. So um, my slides aren't advancing. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. I have an old <laughs> and, and use things for a long time, like my Sony Bio that I've had for 10 years now. <laughs> um, so anyway, just to ma make sure that everybody knows what carts we have and what goes in the different carts. Of course, you're familiar with um, the single family carts here. We have on the left side, the recycling bin, which is gray with a blue top and um, uh, for most people, by far the bigger of the, the bins. And then we've also got the black garbage can and that comes in like three different sizes. And then for people who want a yard trimming cart, we have this green cart where you can put your yard trimmings and put those out um, 
with the other carts on collection day, or you can put your yard trimmings loose in the street. Um, and one of my pet peeves, especially since the pandemic, is uh, so many people out walking, walking their dogs, and they seem to think that uh, poop bags, dog poop bags, can be thrown on yard trimming piles. Is that a kosher way to get rid of your dog poop bags? I'm assuming you're saying no. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously dog poop bags need to go in the garbage. And then here on the multifamily side, you either have um, a blue recycling cart like this one, or if it's a larger multifamily building, then it's gonna have this uh, gray or white cart or bin, and then the green garbage bin. So let's see, okay, so it is advancing now. So um, a big part of recycling is knowing what goes where. And so these are all things that can get put in your recycle bin. Um, and this, you can find these on our sanjoserecycles.org website that was mentioned earlier as well. Um, there's like 300 items on there at least. And so you can go in there and if there's something you're not sure of, you can go there and you can um, find what you're looking for. So this is the stuff that is really important to keep out of your recycle bin because it's either something that could contaminate the recyclables that are in there or it could tangle up the machinery at the, at the material recovery facility. So um, things like textiles, bedding, clothing, shoes, those don't go in the recycle bin. Those are not recyclable. If you can, if they're, you know, serviceable, then take them to Goodwill or some other thrift store. Um, otherwise they go in your garbage bin. Uh, anything like this, hoses, cords, uh, coat hangers, wires or whatever, these are considered tanglers. And this is the kind of thing that if they end up in the, material recovery facility, they could just, you know, gum up the works and then people have to go up there and try and untangle it and it's dangerous work and so forth. Um, diapers and pet waste are not recyclable. Those need to go in your garbage. They're also a health hazard. Um, plastic bags, wraps, films, things like this, these are also tanglers and they don't really have a market for this kind of plastic. And then this is a big one down here at the bottom, all of these food soiled containers. So you might think that this little paper container that this taco or whatever this came in would be recyclable, but if it's got, if it's soiled with food, then it really can't be recycled. And the same goes for this pizza box. If the top of the pizza box weren't greasy or whatever, then you could put that in your recycle bin, but otherwise these things really need to go in your um, garbage. So we say no food, no liquid, no problem. So if it's, if it's things, if, if you've drunk, you know, your Snapple bottle of tea or whatever, and there's a quarter cup of it left or whatever, you need to pour that out. Don't let that go in your recycle bin. So let's see here. Next one. How to recycle clean. So Greg sent me this handy dandy picture of this nut butter jar. And um, as you can see, it's pretty much been, pretty much all the peanut butter in here has been eaten. So this is one of those things where it doesn't need to be pristine, but what we say is on something like this to empty and scrape this container or like a hummus tub or um, a container of yogurt or whatever, scrape the food out of it. You don't have to wash it out. You don't have to put it through the dishwasher or anything like that. And this is clean enough to be recycled. They can handle that much uh, sort of food debris on there. So we have some other programs as well. Um, we have this free junk pickup program that maybe you have used. It's through the recycling haulers and you can um, go to this website, San Jose Environment dot org slash junk pickup and arrange for an appointment. Um, the, the company will come and pick up your items from your curbside at the same time that they uh, do the garbage and recycling pickup. 
and it's unlimited. You can put out, you can have as many appointments as you need, and there is a limit of like three items per appointment. And they won't take absolutely everything, but they'll take most things. And there's a list of what they will and won't take on the website. And then um, the county runs the household hazardous waste um, program. And that's for things like batteries, um, pharmaceuticals that you don't need anymore, paint, um, corrosive things, um, uh, certain kinds of light bulbs, uh, Christmas light strings go through household to, to the household hazardous waste program. Um, this too, you can get a free drop off appointment. Um, unlike the junk pickup program, you take it to them. They don't come to you to get it. And there's a um, there's a permanent household hazardous waste drop off location in North, North San Jose. Well, actually, Northeast San Jose, uh, near Oakland and 101. And they tell you the address when you have your appointment. They don't just broadcast that because they don't want people to just bring stuff in the middle of the night and leave it there. Um, I talked some already about yard trimmings. Uh, yard trimmings, when those are picked up, those are taken to a composting facility in Gilroy and composted and utilized um, in landscape composting. And then maybe you're wondering what happens to food scraps. And you might have heard about other cities or towns that are um, collecting food scraps separately and then composting those and uh, wondering why we don't have a separate food scrap container. And that's because uh, all of the garbage goes to a material recovery facility, somewhat like uh, the recycling material recovery facility and the food scraps are diverted and those are also turned into a different kind of compost from what the yard trimmings is turned into. And any recyclables that were inadvertently put in the garbage can that could be recycled are also taken out. And then just what's left is what is sent to the landfill after that. So Greg sent me some other pictures of uh, things that he people were wondering about. So um, this is a leftover piece of packaging from something that came from 3M. So maybe this was like a, a roll of tape or something. And it's got two different kinds of material on here. It's got this paperboard and then it's got this clear, this clear uh, plastic that might be number one PET or something, but we don't know what it is because it probably doesn't have the little chasing arrow sign to tell you. And something that's uh, mixed material like this does not get recycled. So if you wanted, you could peel off as much of this paperboard on here as you could and put that in your recycle bin, but then this piece of plastic needs to go in the garbage bin. And then this was one that I just confirmed. This, Greg, you didn't send me this, but um, how many of you buy slices of cheese that have these little pieces of paper in between them to keep them from sticking together? Um, sadly, these are food contaminated because they're um, full of oil from the cheese. So those two have to go in the garbage. And then you were wondering about shredded paper. Um, shredded paper, shredded paper is obviously something that could be recycled, but paper that's been shredded can act as a tangler at the material recovery facility. So it's fine to put it in the recycle bin so long as you put it in a clear plastic bag that keeps it from you know, spreading out and going down the conveyor belt loose. And um, any clear plastic bag will do, including something that had a loaf of bread in it before, or you know, tortillas or whatever, just so that they can see that it's actually shredded paper. And then there was a question about polystyrene. I'm assuming that this picture really was about the polystyrene and not so much about the cardboard. But um, polystyrene, as was mentioned earlier, is a, a real problematic material. I mean, it's great insulation, it's great cushioning and stuff, but it's uh, bad when it's manufactured and it's bad after you're done with it. And uh, it cannot be easily recycled. It does not have a good market and needs to go in your garbage can. And because uh, we, we don't recycle it, we don't have a market for it. And 
the, if it's little, you know, like packaging peanuts or whatever, it's really good to put those in a bag before you put them in the garbage can because obviously the, these can become a litter problem pretty easily. And they break down into smaller and smaller pieces and end up in our waterways and end up in the bellies of our marine life. And it's nasty. And you can even see right here, this just looks like a little tiny piece of uh, polystyrene that's gotten off of these. So. And then, of course, this cardboard box can be put in the recycle bin, but it's best to break it down, not to just put cardboard boxes straight in the bin. And then these plastic mailers. This is, um, this is another plastic film that can't go in the recycle bin. So uh, this would go in the garbage, or if your supermarket is still taking back plastic bags, you might be able to take it there. Now this one is kind of an interesting one. This came to my house a couple months ago and I looked at this and I was just a gobsmacked. I was like, what on earth are they doing? Look at all this weird little styrofoam stuff that they put inside this Amazon mailer. And then I, and they've got this thing on here that says recycle this mailer just like a box. And they had this QR code down here and I was just getting all indignant. I was going to put a picture of this on my Facebook page and, and razz on Amazon for this and stuff. And then I hit this QR code and went and read about it. And it turns out that this is not expanded polystyrene. It's, um, it's glue that they've repurposed into sort of a cushioning material that goes inside this bag. And yes, indeed, you can recycle this and, uh, it apparently works out all right. So hats off to Amazon on that one. And a bag of bags cannot go in the recycle bin. It needs to go in the garbage bin as well. Same with these air pockets. This is just another example of plastic film. So uh, anyway, I mentioned earlier San Jose Recycles.org and uh, this is just a really great resource because you can put in here something like Christmas lights as I was doing earlier or um, light bulbs or electronics or whatever. And it, te it tells you about the household hazardous waste program. It tells you where that particular thing goes, maybe a um, yogurt container. Yes, Greg? Oh, no, Am I? Oh. We're, we're getting close to the end here. So am I. <laughs> um, so anyway, I really, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I really recommend when you're unclear on what to do with an item, go to San Jose Recycles.org, um, put it in here, it'll most likely tell you. It'll give you information about our garbage and recycling services, about the household hazardous waste program, junk pickup, what to do with e-waste. There's a variety of different videos about what happens in a MRF and so forth. And um, we've got a new newsletter called The Loop that you're welcome to sign up for and just yet another information source um, that might be useful to you. And then um, I, since uh, what the women earlier were talking about so much was around purchasing, I just thought you might like to know that the city does have an environmentally preferable procurement policy that we follow that is designed to sort of reduce, reuse, and recycle and avoid things that pollute and so forth. And it's really true that um, as consumers, we have tremendous power in our pocketbooks uh, in terms of what we buy. And that can have you know, a big effect on uh, our vendors and what they decide to make. So I encourage you all to use the power of your pocketbook. And if you wanna get a better sense of what kind of environmental footprint you have, uh, Google something called Eco Footprint Calculator and uh, go through the steps in there and, uh, and find out how big a, or how many planets we would need if everybody had your lifestyle. I did that once and I haven't done it in a few years, but when I did it, I found out that if everybody lived like me, we'd need like four planets. So it's a very illuminating way to find out, you know, how much impact you're having and where you might be able to reduce it. Can you put that in the chat when you're finished? Sure. Thank you. Sure. 
And John Oliver did a really wonderful piece about plastics and recycling or not recycling them about a week ago. So if you want Google that, it's entertaining. And, and he was spot on about it. And uh, if you want to um, buy things that don't create plastic waste, there's a store down on San Pedro Square called um, The Source Zero. And there's, you can take your containers and, and fill them up with shampoo or a lotion or whatever. They also sell this really handy dandy little um, floss container, which is reusable. And when I was there the other day, I bought, um, I bought new floss to put in here. And the floss came in this little biodegradable cardboard box. So um, people are catching on. There's a uh, lot more alternatives, as they noted earlier, to just the disposable stuff. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank Linda, you. Would, you, would you be able to uh, stay at the end of the meeting in case people have a couple of questions? Sure. After uh, Andrea talks? Sure. OK, great. Thank you. Sure. All right, you can stop sharing. Thank you very much, Lyndon. Very good information, appreciate it. Are we turning it over to Andrea now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Andrea, you're on. Hi, everybody. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Andrea Erton. I'm the CEO for Home First Services, uh, Santa Clara County, and we are the operators for the site at Burnell, Burnell and Monterey, which is right around the corner from y'all, and which is really close to where I live. So I spend a great deal of time there. Um, easy for me to get to, and I think it's a beautiful site. So I've got some notes here in my email, so if you don't mind, I'm going to hop over to that and I'm gonna read you some of the updates that we have for the site. Um, so currently we have 77 people living on the site. We have 78 units, so that means we have one opening. Uh, we have so far since our grand opening, we've helped four people to housing, another moving out in April. All are using housing problem solving funding. And this is funding through the county that helps us place people into units and gives them a small stipend for a period of time so they can get on their feet. At Rue Ferrari, around the corner from y'all, is a 106 unit site. Two people are currently engaged in housing searches and a few others are starting their um, housing problem solving process. What's really interesting about the Rue Ferrari site is, is that, um, it is either for individuals or couples. And I, by what I mean by couples, we have two brothers sharing a unit. We have a mother and a son sharing a unit. We have a father and a son sharing a unit. So it is a place where families can actually stay together, which is really unusual for the county. There, as far as I know, there aren't any other sites that really allow this unless it's a family shelter. And by family shelter, it normally just means women and children. Um, so that's really, really positive. So the services that are being held at both sites are very, very similar. Um, the first thing we tend to do with people is we help them get their documentation. So, and by that, what I mean is we help people, you know, so one of the first things that happens when you're homeless is you lose your ID you lose, uh, you know, any pertinent information that you've had, identity theft is prevalent. And so that's the first thing we do. You can't get ID, you can't get anything without a permanent address. And so we're able to give these people that address, they're able to get the identification they need, which means now they can sign up for the county programs. They can get on the list for rapid rehousing, they can get on the list for permanent housing, they can apply for disability, they can apply for medical insurance and social services benefits. So all the stuff that you and I take for granted, these people don't have just because they don't have an address. So we're able to solve that very, very quickly for them. Uh, we provide uh, transportation also to critical appointments. Let's say there's a medical or dental appointment, we're able to set that up for them. No problem, we provide that. Um, we had COVID testing on site 
And soon, it happens once a month, and soon we will be adding vaccines to that list. We're currently vaccinating people at all of our shelters, staff and residents. And soon, because we've opened up to the orange tier, the county will actually start vaccinating at our EIH site. So that's really good news. Um, the people who are 65 years and plus, though, have already been offered vaccines. So that's been taken care of. We offer clinical groups, which are mental health groups. And those groups um, are around topics that involve harm reduction, my favorite, which is art therapy, um, support groups, mindfulness, coping skills, and adjusting to new environments. So one of the goals for this site has been that we will be able to take people from our local encampments and place them at this site and help them build the skills that they once had when they were permanently housed. Or if they've never built those skills, help them build those skills. It's really hard for the folks who've been chronically homeless to go from living in an encampment environment to permanent housing. The skills just aren't the same and they don't line up. In an encampment, you're doing crisis management. Every day, it's where do I go to the bathroom? What do I find to eat? How do I get something to eat? If you're a woman, what products, hygiene products do I need for my period? All of those things that, you know, somebody who's housed doesn't necessarily think of in the same way. So we need to take them out of that crisis mode and put them in a mode where they can problem solve, think about financial planning, think about working, anything that will help them be stable. And so that's what this environment is really meant for. Um, that in creating a safe environment for people who aren't able to stay in permanent housing on their own without support. Those people, our emergency interim housing sites are really perfect. Um, so those are some of the things that happen. We also offer case management to anybody on site. Um, and we offer, as far as groups, we offer life skills, goal setting, community meetings. We have bingo night. We have housing search meetings. So how to look for affordable housing. I mean, people don't even know what websites do I go to? How do I find that? And we cover everything from renting a room to sharing an apartment with somebody because many of the folks we serve will never be able to afford a place on their own. It's just reality. Um, we offer a workshop on community resources, managing medical appointments, accessing transportation, and other interventions around meeting clients' needs. So we do surveys on site for the folks who are our residents. We ask them, what information do you need that you don't have? We put together a workshop and we provide it. Uh, we are also rolling out our conscious culture agency-wide, which has been about a year-long process at the executive level and board level, working with consultants and line staff and with focus groups in really identifying the culture that we want to be and the culture that we are and how do we move to where we want to be. And we're including the people we serve in that. And so part of that is a new value that we've added to our fold, which is called activism. And we are actively reaching out um, around issues that, of race equity um, and really standing up to say and to denounce racism in general. We've put out five pub public statements so far. We've hired an agency called Promise 54 to help us really structure our race equity work at a leadership level and then to help us focus a group that we've had for a few years, a cultural diversity inclusion work group that which is of staff and um, trying to make that group more meaningful so they have more influence in the agency and with overall our culture. So we're trickling this down to the people we serve, which makes sense for us. And so we've had uh, International Women's Day, we've had St. Patrick's Day, we're planning a Cesar Chavez Day where we have movies, arts, crafts, and we talk about um, why these holidays are important and who the people are that we're honoring. We also provide linkage and coordination to health insurance, benefit applications, employment, trade school, reunification, 
with natural support systems, including family and friends. And so one of the things that we're engaging in is called family finding, where if we have somebody who tells us they have family living in Kansas City or outside of Kansas City or Ohio or wherever, and they have a disability check that will allow them to live in one of those locations affordably, but they just need to be relocated, we work with the city and county to relocate them. We connect them to that family member or those support people. We make sure there's dialogue and interaction. We help them find a home wherever it is that they wanna be relocated, and then we help relocate them. We don't do that to get rid of people. We wanna keep everybody here who wants to stay here. But what we're doing is trying to create sustainability for these folks in the long run. And if they can't afford to stay here and they're retired, then we've got to figure out another plan for them. I'm currently working on my plan <laughs> for when I retire because Lord knows I can't afford to stay here. Um, so it's something we try to do for everyone. So those are the services and the current numbers of, of what's going on. Um, are there any questions for me? Uh, here's um, uh, out of the 106 units on Roof Ferrari, how many are currently occupied? Uh, 106 on the site. That's a really good question. I believe they're full. I was just there. We had one opening. Yeah. So we have one opening at the site. The amazing thing about these sites is they have filled up quicker than anything else we've ever done. And it's because we're doing a referral system with the county. And so the county already has a queue of people who are available and who have been screened and who fit the criteria for the site. And then the second we open, we move them in. I, 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 I wanna interject a comment. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to interject a comment because I was, um, on another call related to the um, the, the Mayberry site, I, I joined that uh, quarterly advisory group call, and I was told that regarding I think it was regarding the Bernal site that one of the Las Paseos residents called in to ask why nobody was living there, <laughs> and it's full because it's so mm -hmm. quiet and and so just quiet. I mean, there's just you go by and there's not a lot of activity it, it just looks really quiet but I just thought I just got such a kick out of that because it just goes to show how you know it, it not what everybody expected and I appreciate that thank you Karen for saying that um we've we've worked really hard with training staff so that they are capable of uh, managing situations as they occur. And we, we've had very few incidences. We recently have a fire. Somebody might need to put themselves on mute. Um, and unfortunately, that uh, fire was caused by a resident um, who were engaging in behavior that was not acceptable in the cabin. They, the, they caught fire in the bathroom. So yeah, so the fire was a tragedy. And um, it did end in loss of life, which is horrible. Um, and was very difficult on staff. He was very well liked. Um, so I, that's the only incident that we've had at that site. And um, yeah, it was, it was nobody's fault, unfortunately, except for the tenants. And I, and I hate to say that publicly. Um, we're still waiting for the fire report and we'll know more once that happens. Um, so, wow. Um, other than that, we've had very few incidences at our site, as you all know, but I'm happy to address those articles that have been in Spotlight. Um, I was just as shocked one evening when Greg sent me the first article. I hadn't seen it that day. And so Greg sent it to me and asked me about it. And thank you for that, Greg. Um, it helps keeps me informed. Um, oh, charming. Um, so, you know, Home First has, I reached out to the city immediately um, when we got that first article and I asked for a safety assessment. 
uh, of our sites. I had a detailed conversation with James Stage at the city who was responsible for building. And James was very clear, as was my facilities director, that both Rue Ferrari and Monterey and Burnell passed all city inspections. We actually had to go through them several times on some occasions to pass them. They didn't go easy on us. It was a rigorous process. At this point in time, definitely some, um, I wanna say union wage disputes between the city and the contractor. And it sounds like the contractor did not engage in behavior that was acceptable. Um, so the city is doing uh, an investigation on their own of that. I do appreciate that. Uh, and at the same time, it has nothing to do with the running of the sites. It has nothing to do with site operations. Um, so Home First is not involved in that in any way, shape, or form. So I, I really want to address questions for anybody um, about our sites, about the people we're serving, about my staff. Like Karen said, things are going very well. You, you had, thank you. You had mentioned, uh, I don't know if, the, if you had mentioned the, um, the amount of people that have been able to be placed into housing. Did you mention that earlier? I did, it's I'm very a, few, it's very few, Greg. Um, at the first site on Burnell, it's four people have been helped into housing so far with another one on the way. And currently two people at the roof site are engaged in that. Um, the issue with this is there is, um, there's no housing subsidy attached with referrals for these programs, which means there's really no venue for people to get affordable housing. So even if they were able to get a permanent unit, they wouldn't be able to stay in it because they couldn't afford to keep it. And that's what, uh, that's what these sites are so successful at addressing is it gives people a safe place to live with dignity while affordable housing is being built. When that housing is built, we can then move them from these sites into that housing. And that's why these, um, these neighborhoods are gonna be pretty sustainable with the same people for the next couple of years. So we're not expecting much turnover. So your neighborhood is not gonna have the influx of people that you thought it might. It's going to be, it's gonna be pretty stable. Occasionally, like you know, we've seen in the last, you know, what five months, we've moved four people out of one site. That's not much. Um, so it's it it is a good thing in the fact that it creates a very stable environment for the neighborhood. Any other questions? Um, Greg, are we ready to uh, move on, um, move on or Greg? Yes, we're ready to move on, Karen. Okay. Um, well, thanks. That's a great report, Andrea. It, it's wonderful all the services you're providing. I, I had no idea there was that many different services. Um, and it sounds like it's really helpful to these people. It is. It's been, uh, it's been a huge relief and reprieve. And I will make sure that the next time I'm here, I have a success story for you all. So you can actually hear from one of the individuals living there the impact this has had on their life. Oh, that's great. Great. Have a good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you for so your much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Greg, can I still ask my question to the previous speaker on good. garbage? Uh, yes. The question I had is, I got the impression uh, that... On, uh, Terry, uh, please hold on a second. Sure, uh, standing by. Usually the meeting is over, but uh, the people who want to uh, stay around and continue asking questions, I'll keep the meeting going. And I'll also keep the recording going. Go ahead, Terry. Okay, the question I had is, I had the question about garbage recycle. From what I understand, it sounds like garbage plastic bags 
uh, not a good thing to put in a recycled bin. I wanted to clarify that. It's, it's, I, I kind of relate to it um, because, you know, I spend a lot of effort buying those bags and, you know, I'd like to make use of them. <laughs> but if it's going to the recycle bin and not being used, I'd like to know that. They don't go in the recycle bin. They should go in the garbage bin. The suggestions that they had earlier about um, alternatives to plastic bags are a good idea because those are reusable and um, they don't end what up generating the garbage. What about paper bags from the supermarket? Those can go in the recycle bin. And those Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Good Lord. Okay, so looking in the chat, um, has anybody found creative ways to use reuse polystyrene? Not that I know of. I know that um, some polystyrene uh, has been used to make picture frames. That, um, and then somebody heard about our partnership to break down plastic bags into their chemical components. Is that still happening? That was the pilot that was going on at Green Waste Recovery and I haven't had a chance to find out since I got back to environmental services from the emergency operations center if that's still going on or what the status is of that, but I can find out and let Greg know and he could let Smita know. Um, if you put your recycling in a white bag and throw it in the recycle bin, will it be recycled? Um, I heard you have to dump it out so it's all loose. It's better if it's loose because otherwise it, it needs to go through something at the material recovery facility that bake, breaks the bags open so that the materials can be um, spread out and go you know, their merry way into the right um, bales. So if you don't mind just putting it loose in your recycle bin, that's better for us. But if it is bagged, we do have a way to break up those bags and get those recyclables out. Then it says here, what about paper stickers on a waxy paper backing? I don't really know what, what you mean by that, Barbara. If you can, if Barbara's still here and can give, give me a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, it's it's those those stickers that you get in the mail, like the return address stickers. Does the fact I mean it's not oh. it's not like regular paper. It's it's a, a sticker with a sticky adhesive on the back, and it's on a, a piece of waxy paper so that you can peel it off. Can mm -hmm. those go? Are the, can those be recycled as paper, or does the fact that the sticky is there and and I don't know about waxed paper whether that that. I, yeah, wax paper, I, I don't think should go in there. But I think that, you know, like you can put post-its in the recycle bin. And it sounds like these paper stickers are probably analogous to a post-it. So I would say that you could probably do that. But maybe but, not the wax paper that they're that they're sitting on. If you're not correct. using them, you know, if you, the ones you correct. get, the ones you get in the mail that you're not going to use. And I, I have not been recycling them because I didn't know whether they could be recycled. Yeah, I think that the sticker can. I think that the waxy paper cannot. I think the waxy paper would be a little bit like a coffee cup, a disposable coffee cup like you get from Starbucks that has that plastic lining on the inside of the cup that keeps the coffee from, you know, saturating the paper. Um, that cannot be recycled, right, because it's that mixed material. So that's my gray answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this this is Terry uh, Coyote Creek. Uh, could you verify? I've heard that if you had paint, normally you can't throw paint in the garbage bin. But if you throw the paint on like lots of newspapers and it dries out till it's dried paint, then it, you're allowed to put it in the garbage bin. Is that accurate? I can't remember now if it's the garbage bin or the recycle bin. But yeah, a paint can that the paint's been emptied out of and the paint has dried on it. I think that that can go in your garbage bin, but I don't remember for certain. But if you look it up on- I, I, believe, Stennis, I, believe, I believe that we were told that if it's latex paint, in other words, it's water-based paint and it's dried out, it can go in the garbage, but not if it's, if it's oil-based, it won't dry out. And oh, that, okay. And then that would have to go to the household hazardous waste facility. Right. Well, okay, thank you. I remember Thanks. that, uh, like that too, also, Barbara. Okay, well, you guys just taught me something because I hadn't heard the- the delineation between the latex paint and the oil-based paint. So thank you. 
And then some, Michael Von Dahm writes, in another city in Arizona, there's a program to pay homeless people with a job for picking up junk paper, et cetera. Well, we, we do have something like that. We have the downtown streets team and we have been hiring homeless people to do ma outdoor maintenance in the downtown area. And I think that they've been sort of expanding the services that they provide. But I, again, I've been gone for a year and I don't know exactly what the status is of that. But yes, we have done something like that here in San Jose as well. On, on the city council meeting uh, this week, I heard Trash Punks, the founder of Trash Punks, uh, volunteered some of his volunteers to go help uh, District 2 and other places in San Jose to clean up. Yeah, and um, I'm not so familiar with that, but our watershed protection division, they're the stormwater people and they do litter cleanups and creek cleanups every year. They do maybe like 50 of them and half of them are with a contractor who does all the work and then the other half are with volunteers. So um, we've got a lot of that going on as well. I, I think that we could stand to have more litter cleanup events than we do than what we have budget for. So were there other questions? Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, you. I, I do have a question. Um, you mentioned, uh, remember when China stopped taking our stuff because it was contaminated? Yeah. Did you mention the percentage of our um, recycled trucks that end up being contaminated? In, that the I don't know. I, you know you, it's not so much to say what percentage of the trucks are contaminated so much as like what percentage of a cart is contaminated right? How much stuff that's in a cart. And um, I don't know what the current percentage is, but I can try and find out and get back to you about that too. Yeah, please do. If a cart's contaminated, it can contaminate the whole truck. That's one of the problems, right? Yeah. I mean, if you throw a bottle of uh, a disposable bottle of water in there or a disposable bottle of orange juice or whatever, then it's going to get crushed and then that liquid's going to go everywhere. Um, if you put, uh, you know, used motor oil in there or whatever, that's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so you want to know current contamination. Okay. So I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the China sword, is there any action that's being taken place at the city or at the state level where they're actually going to try and um, do something with those recyclable materials rather than shipping them to another market for them to do something with? Um, I think so, yeah. I think that that's partly why there's, you know, the, the emphasis also on the reduce, reuse you know, just not buying the stuff in the first place so that we don't generate, generate the waste on the back end. Um, I know that, you know, while China's not taking some of the stuff, it is being taken by some other countries. But then, of course, that means that still we're not taking responsibility for our waste on yeah. this side of the Pacific, and we need to do that. So... It's uh, a little bit like an oil tanker, you know, you get, you, you get the system in place, you get the logistics, you know, we put all our stuff on the boats, the boats go across the ocean, they leave that stuff off, they fill back up with the, the products that have been made with some of that stuff or whatever, and it comes back. And, you know, for us to suddenly not be sending that stuff there, it's not like we have the um, re recycling infrastructure here that got built up over there. So if we need to start being able to process it on this side of the Pacific, then we need to also have that infrastructure. But I think the main thing is, you know, get away from using it in the first place, especially the plastic. Because I think that as, you know, we switch to electric cars and, um, you know, people and solar panels and we use fewer fossil fuels on the transportation side, one of the things that the fossil fuel industry is thinking is, well, we'll just produce plastics and that'll you know, make up the revenue stream that we lose on the transportation side. 
So to the extent that we can, you know, avoid that is great. And um, to the point of the young women who spoke earlier, I have a um, bag in my trunk that's got reusable plate, reusable silverware, um, Tupperware containers, so that when, you know, back in the old days when my husband and I used to go out and eat at a restaurant or something, you know, like if we went out for pho, then um, we would put the leftover pho in our own container and take it home as opposed to taking yet another plastic container home from the restaurant or another styrofoam container or whatever. So um, anyway, we, we all have power and we all need to be you know, advocating for effective policies at the state level so that um, you know, we can try and move ourselves in a more sustainable direction. Uh, this is Terry again. Uh, I just want to uh, make a suggestion. I'm not looking, it's not a question, it's not an answer, but I just want to see the, the thought. I'm an engineer, so I look at things from a, another perspective. You know, the problem with plastics, actually we are fighting a losing battle could be because as long as we're pumping oil, we need to get it at the source. That's the source of the plastic and we can't get rid of it. Now, we could probably get rid of it because I was out on the ranch and you know, the ranchers use fences that are miles long, miles and miles of wood. But the latest thing is have plastic fences that last a lot longer. If we could use plastics that would last forever, but as long as we're producing oil and you know, there's a lot of oil that's being produced in the world. I think that's where we should attack it. Eddie, I just want to make a comment. It's not a question. I just want to seed some thought. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for staying late. Shouldn't we wrap it up, you guys? <laughs> Let this poor lady go. Yes. <laughs> it's all right. I'll I'll go to work late tomorrow. I'll walk my dog in the morning. <laughs> Since I didn't walk her tonight. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Great information. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. Yes. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Okay. All right. I well, have this recording uh, stopped right now.